Amen. So in 2020, whoa, 2020, whew. In 2020, it was a few months after the pandemic, you know, it was like, the pandemic was like a roller coaster, right? Like everything shut off and then it kind of opened up and then it shut off and then, okay, you know, it's just this like roller coaster. Well, in one of those windows where travel was still open and uh, it, was, it was cool to go visit a new place, uh, my family and I, we decided, man, we gotta get out. Like, let's, let's get to Arizona. My brother lives in Arizona and my wife's uncle owns a place in Arizona. So it just worked out perfect. Now at the time, Judah was five, Journey was four, and Royce was just over six months old. So traveling with three kids under the age of five isn't always the easiest thing to do. Shout out to all the parents traveling with young kids. Hello. So we decided to invite my wife's sister with us to have a little bit of extra help. Pro tip to you young families. If you gotta coerce your mother-in-law to come with, I promise you, it'll, it'll be a great move for a couple nights out to take your honey on a date. Okay, here we go. Back to the story. So we get on the plane, and the kids are, man, they're, they, it's like they're on a roller coaster, hands in the air. Yeah, like, let's go. We're having a good old time. We land in Phoenix, direct flight. Come on, love it. We get there, and I'm like, you know, we're, I mean, we got car seats, luggage. We just look like the Brady Bunch, man. It's crazy. We got to get an actual cart just to get through the airport. So I'm like, hey, y'all wait here. I'll be a servant of the Lord. Hop on this bus and I'll go over to get our rental car. I'll be back in like 20 minutes. You don't even have to lift your hand. I'll get out of the car, come get the luggage. I'll bring it in the car. It'll be all good and we'll be on our way. Cool. So I get on this bus and I go over to the rental car place and I walk in the south entrance and I realize that the counter that I need to go to for the place that I was getting this rental car from was on the north end of the building. But I look down the way and I'm like, wait a second. Why is the line wrapping all the way around to the south entrance? What have I walked into? I'm thinking to myself, oh boy, this is gonna be a while. I've got a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-month-old at the airport. What is my wife gonna do as I stand here in line? I'm like strategically thinking like, can I just cut the line and apologize? Like, they'll surely understand, won't they? So I text her, I'm like, hey, it's gonna be a while. I was, you know, thinking maybe 45 minutes. An hour and a half passes, still in line. Two hours passes, still in line. Finally, in between that hour and a half and two hours, I get up to the counter to finally get the rental car. Now listen, your boy was renting a minivan. Yeah, driving around Phoenix in the minivan. I was stoked, like I, we don't own a minivan, so I was excited to drive this minivan. So I get to the counter, and she's like, license and credit card. Like she, I mean, I was frustrated by the line. I think she was equally frustrated. I wanted to be like, yo, you're in the customer service business though, so at least put a smile on your face. Like, you're making us feel bad. And I said, credit card. I don't, I don't have a credit card. I have, I, I, I follow Dave Ramsey. I listen to him and <laughs> stuff. And I've got, I've got a debit card. Debit card? Like, I've always rented with a debit card. She's like, sorry, sir. You need a credit card to rent a minivan. Best I can get you in with your debit card is a little sedan. Thinking, sedan ain't fitting three car seats, lady. I just waited two hours in line. I'm about to lose my salvation right now and jump over this counter. You in the customer service business. Let's make this thing right. Can't you make a, 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 a little bit of a, um, you know, can you like make something happen for me? Come on, can't you pull some strings or something? Like this is the inner dialogue. No, your pastor did not lose it like that. This is what's going on in my mind. So anyways, long story short, I walk away from the counter with my tail between my legs. No rental car, and I'm in the middle of an airport going, what am I gonna do? My five-year-old, four-year-old, and six-month-old are over at the airport. My wife is texting me like videos of them doing calisthenics in the airport. Like she's doing everything to distract them, but by this time, she's run out of everything. Like they're hungry, they're tired, 
this is not good. For the first time in the world, I sat in the middle of the airport. And listen, I, I consider myself a problem solver. Like, that's what I do. Like, that's part of my role in the ministry and the other, you know, experiences that I have outside the ministry. And I sat there, and I didn't know what to do. Every other rental car place had a line just as long. I'm thinking, where do I go? What do I do? I didn't know what to do. But all I know is when my wife called me, boy, did I unload on her. I was like, this lady was so rude. She asked me for a credit card. We follow Dave Ramsey talking about credit card. They didn't send me an email letting me know that I needed a credit card. This is their fault. They're in the customer service business, and they made me feel like I was stupid. This is crazy. Like, I'm painting this picture like she's the bad guy, and the company that started with an Al and ended with a Mo was the bad guy. I started thinking to myself as as God was reminding me of this story as I was preparing to speak about this idea and this temptation to gossip about how in that moment, the shame that I felt as a leader, because when I showed up to that counter, I wasn't prepared. It wasn't her problem. It didn't matter how she was treating me. It wasn't Alamo's problem. It was my problem. I'm the one that showed up not prepared with what I needed to get what they could provide me. But the picture I wanted to paint with my wife was that they were the bad guy, that I was mistreated by them. And this is what we do when we gossip. Listen, we wanna elevate ourselves above a person or a situation, and oftentimes it's connected to our lack of identity or our insecurity. This is what I was feeling. I was feeling so insecure as a husband in this moment, and so I wanted to paint this picture that was so opposite of reality. I think it's so interesting the trap that we can fall into, and if you're a note taker, you can write down the title of my message. It's called Bite Your Tongue with a subtitle, Overcoming the Temptation to Gossip. You can turn to Proverbs 26, 22. This will sort of set up the message today, and it says this in the NLT version. It says, rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. I'll get to this later, but what we need to recognize is our tongues aren't the issue. The words and the tone are not the issue. It's like, what's the issue when the issue isn't the issue? And here's what I know is the issue is connected to something deeper. It it comes from the heart. And it's interesting that it says here that rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep into one's heart. Isn't it interesting that when we gossip, it kind of feels good on the surface, but it's actually polluting our heart. I like what the NIV version says. It says the words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down into the inmost parts. I wish I could combine these versions, and if I did, I would say this. The words of gossip are like choice morsels. They sink deep into one's heart. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not too good at English, and so when I read dainty morsels and choice morsels, I wasn't really sure what that was saying. So I looked it up, and you wanna know what a choice morsel is? It's a small, tasty bit of food. Mmm. You're like, don't even start, dude, or I'm gonna get out of my seat and go straight to the buffet right now. Dainty morsel. Here's what I wrote down. Gossip is like the Pringles original slogan. Once you pop, you can't stop. (laughs) Maybe it's not Pringles for you. Maybe it's them peanut M&Ms. Hello. You know, oh, honey, I just want a third of the bag. I'll save two thirds tomorrow for you when you make your popcorn. Honey gets up next morning to make her popcorn. All the M&Ms are gone. (laughs) Maybe it's not popcorn or pizza or peanut M&M's, whatever. I don't know what it is for you, but once you pop, you can't stop. There's something about gossip that kind of feels a little bit mischievous and juicy, and I'm kind of, you know, it just, it it sort of, it appeals to our flesh a little bit. Now, I want to establish a, a working definition for gossip, and I think Rick Warren said it well. He said this, when we are talking about a situation with somebody who is neither part of the problem or part of the solution, then we are probably gossiping. Yeah, everybody just got real quiet. (laughs) 
when I read that, I was like, oh, wow. So God, what if you're in the people business? Like, <laughs> It can somewhat feel a little bit gray, if I'm really honest. Here's what I wrote down. There are occasionally times that you have to talk about someone who isn't present, but I wanna give you a filter for when you do that. Can I do that? This is like what I would call a gossip filter. Two things to ask yourself. So when you're tempted to talk about somebody that isn't in the room, ask yourself these two things. Number one is, how am I talking about the person who isn't present? Like, how are you portraying them? How are you talking about them? And would you talk that way if they were in the room? Number two is this. Ask yourself this question. Why am I talking about that person who isn't present? I think these two things can be a great filter for us. And you combine that with what Craig Rochelle said. He said this. Everything that is said must be true, but not everything that is true must be said. I think that's sometimes uh, you know, what we do. It's like we feel released if something is truthful to bring it up. That's why you got people at the prayer meeting talking about we need to pray for Betty Sue. <laughs> Come on now. The prayer meeting turns into a gossip session. We talking about Betty Sue, who isn't in the room, who isn't present, who can't talk about her situation, didn't raise her hand for the prayer request. Here's what I know, the enemy loves gossip. You might be asking, why are we talking about this today? Get out of my business, man. I'm talking about it because the enemy loves gossip, and here's why. Because it turns our attention away from God and gets it on demand. It turns our attention away from God and gets it on man. We become critical of man instead of staying connected to God. Here's what happens, and here's what I want us to understand. When my eyes get on man and off of God, it's just a matter of time before I start getting critical of man, which ultimately distorts my connection with God. Now I'm walking with a spirit of criticism, with a spirit of judgment, rather than walking in a spirit of grace, spirit of humility, a spirit of God, I can't believe you've forgiven me this much. Of course I'm gonna walk in forgiveness with my brothers and sisters. Of course I'm gonna go have the tough conversation with humility. We get disconnected from, uh, from, from God, we start getting critical of man, and here's what happens. If enough of us are doing this for long enough, which when you're in community operating like this way, you have to understand that when your friend is gossiping with you about somebody else in the community, and then that, go that gossip starts spreading, guess what ends up happening to the relational soil of a community? It becomes toxic. And before long, you wonder why there's division and discord in a community. It's because we let gossip run like wildfire. So here's what I want to tell us, church. Who stops gossip? How do we stay healthy as a community? How do we stay healthy as believers? If it's not you and I, who's it going to be? And if it's not now, when? If it's going to be, it is up to me. I've got a choice to make, I've got a part to play, and I don't know about you, but the power of life and death is in the tongue, and I wanna lift others up and not tear them down. Is anybody with me today? There's so much at stake. We can't create battles on the inside of the camp because the battle out there is big enough. What's interesting is when we start bickering and fighting and, and battling one another, Satan's like, yo, I can go mess with another church. Y'all are taking care of it yourself. I don't even need to come against you. We've got a city to reach. We've got a neighborhood to love. We've got a school to win over. Is anybody with me in here? And we've got to get our eyes on Jesus so that we don't fall into this trap. I'm just telling you, God wants to move in a powerful way as we take him at her, his word because this, is what's so, this was what was so convicting about me. And I'm gonna use this language, but do you know that God hates gossip? He hates it. That's strong language. And when I wrote that, I was like, man, wow, that's, that's tough. But here's, here's, what, here's what I wrote down why I believe God hates gossip. 
and they're gonna put this on the, on the screen for you. I believe God hates gossip because it pollutes the heart that his son died to make pure. He desires that you and I would walk in the righteousness of God, that we would recognize our identity, that it wasn't earned, that it, there's, no, there's no amount of works or morality that can cause us to be righteous. We are righteous by faith because of the blood of Jesus. But we better walk like it, talk like it, act like it, believe like it. Is anybody with me? This is what he calls us to. And in Proverbs 6, 16, it says this. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Before I go any further here to read the thing that he hates, I do wanna say this. I wanna add some commentary to this. We ought to love what God loves and hate what God hates. The problem is our culture is telling us to love what God hates and hate what God loves. This is why you need to be a self-feeder because the Bible reveals who God is and what he cares about. We cannot be a generation that is biblically illiterate because that's when you start calling yourself a Christian living like the world. That's why, that's our heart. That's, I, I mean, I'm just telling you, like, I'm so thankful for leaders that challenge me with this because to this day, this thing confronts me. When's the last time you were in your word and it confronted you? This thing is like a sword. When's the last time, when's the last time you received a word in here that cut you up? Come on. So, 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 so powerful. I believe that we've got to get a fear of the Lord revelation as it comes to this. Now, if, if God hating it wasn't enough to move you and I, I, get, I came up with three reasons why I believe gossip can ruin a gospel-centered community. So I want you to write this uh, question down. Why is gossip a problem? There's three reasons that I felt like as I was praying, um, God gave me these, these three reasons. The, num the number one reason is this, is because it leads to, or it causes division and discord. I kind of already alluded to this, but it's interesting because gossip spreads like wildflower, a wildfire. I love this quote. This is so, so funny. Gossip can travel the world before truth gets out of bed to put its pants on. Here's the interesting thing. The enemy will use gossip to create division and discord, but division and discord delay destiny. Let me give you a perfect example. It's Numbers chapter 12. The 12 spies go out to spy the land, their destiny, their promised land. Two come back with a good report, agreeing with God. Ten come back with a report that I believe is just, they weren't agreeing with God, they were agreeing with their flesh. And that's oftentimes what happens is we get caught in our emotions in our feelings, in the way we see things. We, 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 we move from a heavenly perspective to an earthly perspective. And guess what? The 10 spies that come back with the bad report, they start spreading the bad report. Guess what? They spent 40 years in the wilderness. The division and discord delayed their destiny. Now here's why I think God allows this to happen. Here's why I believe division and discord become a blessing blocker. Because God isn't just concerned about getting you to your destiny. He's concerned about how you get there. It's not just about an external achievement or an external place or receiving something, which is, in our culture, we get inundated by this. But he cares about what's going on on the inside. He doesn't want us to squander our destiny or squander our promised land. Is anybody with me today? He cares about getting us there in the right heart, in the right posture, with the right character. With the right character, gossip causes division and discord, number one. Number two, I believe that gossip is a problem because gossip damages relationships. Have you experienced that before? Maybe you're in here today, and as we're talking about this, you're thinking, man, this hits home. And maybe you lost a friend because you were gossiping about them, or maybe you were offended or you were on the, on the receiving end of, of somebody gossiping about you. And here, here's what I like to say is that the reason why it damages re relationships is because it lowers trust in the relationship. Tr 
trust is what creates, is the currency for psychological safety in our relationships. So I wrote it down like this. Gossip creates mistrust, and wherever there is mistrust, there will be minimal connection. Because you, you do not connect with people on an intimate level that you do not trust. This is what gossip ruins. It, it damages relationships, and it leads us away from intimacy. And now, the problem with it is we start building relationships on surface level, and we wonder why we feel disconnected. You don't have a problem building relationships you have a problem trusting people. I believe today, in the name of Jesus, I speak prophetically over this church, those of you that have been hurt by gossip, you will trust again. By the power of the Spirit, you will experience deep, meaningful connection, like the community of God should. Our relationships inside of the church should look different than what people experience outside of the church. Is anybody with me? And I think number three, the reason why gossip is a problem, is it stifles the momentum of the gospel. In a season when we should be taking ground, I've seen it time and time again, is when the enemy will tempt a community with gospel. Why? Because it's the easiest way to stir up bitterness, resentment, frustration, and unforgiveness. Those are things that he hasn't called us to walk in. Can I get an amen in this place today? So what ends up happening is we get distracted. So instead of spreading the gospel, we're distracted mending the damage that gossip caused. I've experienced this before. I remember in a taking ground season in particular, there's one season I'm thinking of where it's like, man, we are walking into our destiny. We're taking ground. I found myself in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting trying to put fires out because of all this chaos. Now listen. As a pastor, I'm not complaining about that. We're, we're called to, you know, and you're gonna see here, like part of the challenge for us is we've gotta be willing to have those hard conversations, to be courageous and bold and vulnerable and transparent. But man, when it's creating distraction from the mission, we've got a problem on our hands and we've gotta call it for what it is. So this is, this is why I see gossip as a problem. I remember um, a few years back, I was uh, at a Chinese restaurant with my family. Oh gosh, I would love some Chinese food right now. <laughs> some of y'all are about to go to Hy-Vee Chinese after this, aren't you? Ooh, get your Mr. Pib and some orange chicken, let's go. <laughs> wow, some of y'all just came back. I just did that just to get you back into this message, baby. You daydreaming, wow. So I was at this Chinese restaurant with my family and uh, we were sitting there and these young folks walked in and they were sitting around a circular table. Now, it was so interesting because I'm sitting there with my family, we're having a good time, and there was probably like six or eight what appeared to be like high school students. And they're sitting around this table and I, I kid you not, no joke, I'm here to report, this is, I'm not gossiping, I'm telling you truth right now. These six to eight students sitting around this table, they didn't have one conversation with one another. They were on their phone the entire time, probably Snapchatting one another. Man, this food is real good. I'm like, yo, why don't you just talk to them? They're like right there. You know, I'm like judging them. So, you know, as I'm, as I'm you know, preparing for this message, I'm thinking to myself, bro, what, like, first of all, why are you so concerned by that? Well, number one. Number two, I remember that after that happened, I was like talking about it with a few people. And then, it, and then it dawned on me this week, and it, this goes back to what I said earlier, but I, I, need to, I need us to understand this. Here's what I realized. The reason why I wanted to talk about that or kind of laugh about that or gossip about that situation is because it would elevate me above the distraction. Because guess what I get distracted by? My phone. This is, this is why we gossip at times. Remember, it goes back to, what did I say? Our ability to overcome the temptation to gossip or give into it is connected to first, your identity or lack thereof. If you don't have identity and you struggle with insecurity, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna talk about everybody else's stuff so you don't have to deal with yours. 
man, it's real quiet in here today. I, I'm just, I just threw myself under the bus. Isn't this what we do, though? Isn't this so real? We try to paint these pictures that make us feel better about ourselves. And this is dangerous. This becomes a trap. So we need to consider, like, where, where is our security in Christ today? Where is our identity really at? I believe that, that this becomes a justification mechanism for us. Like I said, I don't need to deal with my issues when I'm more concerned about yours. Cause me to feel good about my season or my situation. Continue to sort of coast through life. Be casual about life. But when we're casual, that's when casualties show up. So this is why gossip's a problem. But I want us to ask this next question, what does gossip produce? There's three things I wrote down for this as well. Number one, gossip produces pain in the person it's about. Proverbs 16, 28 says this, a troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. It doesn't have to be that way, but the reality is, is there are a lot of broken relationships that go back to gossip. If you've been gossiped about, it hurts. It's painful, doesn't it? It's kind of like you think about the kids that play the telephone game. You know, you tell the kid one thing and they pass it on to 10 people. By the time it gets to the end, it's, it's like totally distorted. This is what happens with gossip. You got people talking noise about you, sharing stories, but the reality is, is they heard it from this person, they heard it from this person, they heard it from this person. By the fifth time, man, you're like, you know, you've, you've, you've been taken over by, by the devil or something, you know? It's like the story is, is completely off the charts. Listen, gossip hurts the person that it's about. Number two, gossip produces toleration in the person listening. I wrote this down. What you permit, you promote. So something that we need to take inventory on, some of you are like, this message ain't for me. I don't gossip. Uh-uh. Nope, I'm good, OC. Let me ask you this. Are you creating an atmosphere where people, where people feel comfortable gossiping to you? Gossip produces toleration in the person listening. Proverbs 17, 4 says, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. I believe this. If you don't address the conviction that you feel when you're participating in gossip, it will lead to you being comfortable with it. And I also want to just add this. If they're talking about your friend to you, don't you think they're talking about you to your friend? If they're willing to talk about your friend who isn't in the room, just remember who they're talking about when you aren't in the room. Number three, gossip, gossip produces mistrust in the person that's speaking it. Proverbs 25, 9 and 10, this goes back to the relational brokenness. Some of you are thinking, man, nobody wants to be friends with me. When arguing with your neighbor, don't betray another person's secret. Others may accuse you of gossip and you will never regain a good reputation. I wrote down this quote, talking badly about someone else when they're not around says more about you than the person you're talking about. So I wanna bring us back. I wanna bring us back to this filter because we gotta understand that, that if we're speaking gossip, we have to understand that what we're really doing, even though it kind of feels good, and we can kind of believe the lie that like, wow, this is like a safe place to share this, is we're actually losing trust with people. And trust is gained in droplets, but it's lost in buckets. We won't have deep, meaningful relationships if we're constantly gossiping. So we've, so we've looked at why is gossip a problem? We've talked about um, the, the impact of like what it produces in our lives. But number three, and this is what I wanna close with, is how do we prevent gossip? Because some of you are like, okay, I get the point, dude. Like, can you just land the plane? Give me some, something practical. I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you two practical things. For the listener, like you're in the room and you're like, man, as I reflect, yeah, there are just a lot of people that I'm creating an environment where people just feel free to talk about whoever, whatever, whenever. Here, here's, here's the practical wisdom I wanna give you is this. Stop making it comfortable for people to gossip. Proverbs 29, 
17 says, a gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around with chatterers. If you make it comfortable for someone to gossip, you are part of the problem. We have to be courageous enough, and it is uncomfortable, but we've gotta be courageous enough to do one of two things. Either A, confront the person that wants to gossip and say, yo, here's, and here's, here's, a, here's a real practical way to do this. Just ask them this question. Have you spoken to blank about this issue? Now, if they don't wanna respect that, that's when we go to number two. It might be time to start hanging around, hanging around some different people. This is the point in the message where I wanna challenge our body with the Matthew 18 principle. In Matthew 18, uh, verse 15, it says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Listen, this is so beautiful because it gives us what our motivation should be. Our motivation at all times should be forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration. And if it's not that, it's from the pit. That should be the motivation, is restoration. For the community to be restored, for the relationship to be restored. Now this is addressing somebody that's sinned against you, but sometimes you just need some understanding on a decision that was made, something that was said, fill in the blank. I don't know what it is, but we've gotta change confrontation's connotation. We've gotta pick up the phone, schedule the meeting, show up to the meeting and say, Pastor Todd, help me understand fill in the blank. With humility and clarity and tact, help me understand. Because the longer it sits, the worse it gets. When we don't address stuff, now our vain imagination paints pictures that could be totally not true. And who loses? You do. It pollutes your heart and deems you ineffective of carrying out the ministry and call that is on your life. We've got to address the things that we need to address. I remember a few years ago, the Lord said to me real clearly, stop complaining about something that you're unwilling to confront. So we've gotta stop creating these environments. Number two is this, is we've gotta start praying for the person you wanna gossip about. So if you're the person that you're being tempted to gossip a lot in this season, you're actually picking the phone up and having a, you're struggling with this, it's, it is truly like Pringles. Like you pop in and you ain't stopping. Start praying for that person or that situation that you wanna gossip about. This is why I titled it, Bite Your Tongue. Proverbs 21, 23, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. I wrote down, OC, shut that loud mouth and start praying. Come on, stop polluting and start praying and before long, you will stop gossiping and start prophesying. I'm believing that over your life, that you're gonna be a person that speaks life into people situations, destiny. God gave you this mouth to lift others up. I wrote this down. It's hard to be pr critical of a person or situation that you are constantly inter interceding for. So I wanna give you a really practical challenge. We're a couple days away from June. I'm gonna give you a 30-day praise and prayer challenge. You ready for it? This is not like a church-wide thing. This is just, for some of you, this is the practical step you need to take. You need to praise God for that person or that situation for 30 straight days, and you need to pray about it. I promise you, if you'll take me on this challenge and you'll start talking to God about it and not to your friends about it, let's see what happens after 30 days. I believe something could shift. I believe something supernatural can happen when we start operating in the supernatural. Do you believe it? Luke 6.31 says, do to others as you would like them to do to you. I wrote this down as it relates to the prayer and praise challenge. Start treating that person in the spirit how you would want them to start treating you in person. Wow. In faith, I'm gonna bless them. I'm gonna bless that circumstance. I'm gonna go in the opposite spirit. I'm not gonna give in to my flesh or my emotions. I'm gonna acknowledge those and I'm gonna give those to the king because he cares about them. 
I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna make that exchange, exactly like Denise, I'm gonna make that exchange. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my emotion. I'm gonna give you what I feel and trade it for the righteousness of God so that no matter what situation, circumstance, or season I'm walking through, I will not be stopped because there's a mission at hand. There's a people to love. And I just believe that as we stand to our feet, I wanna close with this prophetic picture. I've got some toothpaste in my hand. <laughs> if y'all came close enough, you'd be like, boy, you need to brush your teeth. Just try preaching, you know, two, two encounters in a row. PT knows what I'm talking about. Somebody hand me a mint when I get off this stage. <laughs> But it's interesting, I started thinking about words and conversations are a lot like toothpaste. Once it's out, you can't get it back. So you might be hearing this today, this message, and you might be experiencing some conviction. I believe in a room this side, there, there's some of you that are, you're feeling condemned right now, and that is not from God. The heart of the Father is, is love and grace. He's not condemning you. He wants, he's got something better for you. But you and I can't get those conversations back. We can't get those words back. But what we can do is we can experience something new from here forward. We need to understand that Jesus told us that this is a heart issue. Gossip, complaining, speaking life, it is a heart issue. Luke 6, 45 says a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So the good news that I wanna finish with, because I wanna finish with some good news today, is that you don't have to be a gossip. Not only can you and I be forgiven today, but we don't need to be indulged in our past, but by faith, we can be found in the righteousness of God today. Standing in gossip-free righteousness, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. No, we can't boast about this. He did it, he finished the work. So guess what, sometimes when we're in a practical book like the book of Proverbs, we can hear a message like this and we can walk out and we can say to ourselves, man, I'm gonna muster it up this week, I'm gonna pull my bootstraps up, I'm not gossiping about anybody. Then a week goes by and we fall ourselves in that trap again. This is not something that can be worked out in the flesh, but it can only happen by being empowered by the Spirit of the living God. But there's only one way for the Spirit of God to empower us, we need to be in Christ. you and I will confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that he was raised from the, the dead, the Bible says that we will be saved. And as we, as we sort of land the plane on this message, I wanna be super clear because I know there are people at this 11 o'clock encounter that you've, no, you've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you might be interested in God or maybe you've been coming around church or you grew up in the church or a friend invited you. Maybe you're super far from God. Praise God that you're in the room today. The reality is you're not here by accident, you're here by design today. There's a creator that knows the hairs on your head that wants relationship with you and wants to empower you by his spirit. When you make this confession of faith, he fills you with his spirit and now you no longer have to try to walk out this life that he created you for on your own. He is the helper that wants to live with you, walk with you. Is anybody thankful for that in this place today? Jesus Christ came to planet Earth in the form of man, and he died the death that you and I deserved. And what did he pin to that cross? What did he take on his back? He took our gossip. Come on, he took all the sin, past, present, and future, and he put it on himself. It's the great exchange. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And all we have to do is turn, repent, receive it by faith. And I believe that in a room this size, there are some of you that this is your opportunity to make peace with your maker. To leave here different. To leave here empowered. To leave here filled up. To leave here with what the Bible says, a new creation. 
The old is gone and the new has come. So here's what we're gonna do. You have a minute to reflect on this, to think about where you're at today. And you need to ask yourself this question. Am I ready to follow Jesus? You're not gonna get it perfect, but he did and he fills you. And that opportunity is in this place today. So as the band plays, if I'm speaking to you today and you know you need to make peace with God, you could be in the front row, the middle section, or the back row. Make your way forward as they pray, or excuse me, as they play, and then I'm gonna pray with you. Church, be praying. This isn't the time to hit brunch. This is the time to pray for souls, because I believe in this room, there's somebody that needs to make peace with God. Come on, let's pray, and I'm believing by faith that today is your day.